What's up everybody, GenX Dividend Investor here. In this valuable video, I tell you what my estimates are for how fast I think each of my dividend stocks will grow in 2024. I'll also share an insightful clip of a billionaire investor who was interviewed on CNBC in the last few weeks that I think you should listen to, so I recommend you watch this entire video. And Merry Almost Christmas to those of you who celebrate, and Happy Holidays for everyone else. If you'd like to skip straight to my stocks, then feel free to use the timestamp on screen, but I recommend you don't jump ahead. Now in my previous videos, I've explained all the reasons why the passive income I get from dividend stocks is much more valuable to me and my family than just selling shares. My dividend portfolio today is designed for income generation and some stock appreciation along with lower volatility, thus I've not made growth my priority. What I mean is that if my goal was for stock appreciation more than anything else, then I'd own stocks that I felt would do that, regardless of if they had a dividend or not or what their yield might be. I do own two low dividend yielding stocks in Apple and Microsoft, which don't help my income needs too much. But since I want to remain retired on dividends, then I limit how much of my overall portfolio is held in low yield stuff, which also helps explain part of the reason why I don't own good companies like Visa or Costco. Now my kids' portfolios are different. They have some stocks like Apple and Microsoft in them, but they also have some non-dividend stocks like Google, Amazon, and Tesla because my kids' needs and goals are different than mine. Anyway, my retirement dividend portfolio's primary goal is to confidently yield enough income to pay for my family's mortgage, food, healthcare, etc., while also appreciating over time. Beating the market isn't what I'm focused on, and I've actually never really focused on that. I mean, I just wanted to invest in decent stuff and get reasonable returns, and I was cool to sometimes beat the market and sometimes not. And while I occasionally went into riskier investments, the majority of my investable income usually went towards steady eddy blue chip companies. I'm confident that if anyone invests in decent stuff at decent prices over a long period of time, they'll do quite well. Combine that investing philosophy along with living within a budget, and then you'll do really well. And one way to help yourself live within a budget is to actually plan your finances out. We hopefully have money coming in from our job or our investments or whatever, and we have money going out due to living expenses. The best time to invest is when you don't think you need to, but unfortunately one mistake I often see people is not making life changes until they're forced to. Like sometimes it's not until someone has a heart attack that they really start focusing on eating healthier. Or they start living frugally once they lose their job, whereas if they had been living carefully all along, then when the inevitable job loss happens, they would be able to better manage it. Or as they get closer and closer to retirement, they finally start putting money into their retirement accounts. But man, wouldn't it have been nice if they had started sooner? It's never too late to go on a better path, but it's also never too soon. I just saw a study today that found that so many people are afraid of running out of money in retirement that they don't feel like they're enjoying their life. 61% of Americans are more afraid of running out of money in retirement than they are of dying. And figuring out how much money you need for retirement is challenging. You'll probably have higher medical expenses as time goes on. Maybe you want to leave your assets for your kids or grandkids. Most people don't spend time improving their financial literacy, so they aren't aware of strategies that could allow them to have higher spending levels while still preserving their assets. Retirement can be challenging if you go in blind. Heck, it can even be challenging simply changing your mindset from investing to spending. Of course, the reality is that you need to find a balance between spending and investing such that you're living now and also preparing for the future. Most people focus too much on the now, and some of us, probably me, focus too much on the future. Anyway, if my goal was to beat the market and I didn't care about dividend income, then I'd move into inexpensive quality stocks that I'd calculate could enable the highest total returns. Which reminds me, sometimes people ask me if I think my portfolio would outperform some other YouTubers out there, let's say Jeremy from Financial Education, and I think it's an interesting question, but it also tells me that they hadn't really understood why I do what I do, and what my goals are and why. Note, I've actually not watched any of Jeremy's videos for a few years, not because I don't like him, but merely because shortly after starting my channel, I stopped watching other people's videos. And when someone says outperform, I assume they're talking about total returns, because if they're talking about dividend income, then my portfolio would probably do better. I do know he is or was a big Tesla bull, and I think he likes some small cap stuff, but I honestly don't know what he's holding these days. Regardless, in my experience a good growth portfolio should have more total returns than an income focused portfolio over long periods of bull markets. Sure, in bear markets the income portfolio will probably outperform, and usually a retiree's portfolio looks different than a young person's portfolio, and those young folks tend to take more risks which can mean more returns, but also more losses, and the older folks tend to want to minimize the downside more than they optimize for the upside. Hopefully all that is intuitively obvious to you. And even if Jeremy's high growth portfolio quintupled my total returns, I'd still not want his portfolio for me and my family, which might be hard for anyone to understand unless they watch my videos and knew about my health issues and such. So it can be fun to compare things, but it's important to recognize that different people have different goals and risk tolerances and timeframes and such, so what might make sense for you might not make sense for someone else. Anyway, onto the point of this video. I plan to show you estimates for the annualized earnings growth of my tickers for 2024 because stock prices tend to follow earnings over long periods of time. And you can watch a recent video I did called Which of My Dividend Stocks Are Cheap in December of 2023 to understand how I value each of my tickers. 
In this video, I'll skip giving estimates for the ETF tickers I own, and if you want to see my entire portfolio in Fidelity, then watch a video I just did called $2 million plus dollar dividend portfolio, new daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly dividend records. Okay, now I'd like you to listen to billionaire investor Ron Barron in this two-minute CNBC clip from a month ago. I just want to know, in this particular moment, given where you may think the market is, given where bond prices are, I think a lot of people are really trying to rethink what's the mix of what a portfolio is even supposed to look like in this world, given what's happening in Israel, uh, in Ukraine and the like. Are, are you buying stuff? What are you doing? Every day. I'm con I am amazingly bullish. And so basically in 1960s, uh, there was Vietnam War, uh, there was inflation, uh, there were ta assassinations of the presidents of the United States, president of the United States. Uh, there was assassination of Robert Kennedy, assassination of Martin Luther King. Uh, I was a patent office examiner in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, and I went to law school at night and worked in patent office at daytime. And one day, uh, right after King is assassinated, uh, one of my friends, I'm on one side of the office, went, runs over and said, Ronnie, come over here. And I ran to the other side of the building. All of Washington was on fire. Amazing. So we got our motorcycles and drove in. You're not allowed to. We broke into the city, driving around and came back. But that was a city falling apart. It looked like the country was ending. There would have been marches on Washington. And the market, the Dow Jones was 1,000. The GDP was 800. 800 billion, that's now 27 trillion. The Dow Jones was 1,000 then, it's 34,000 now. It's five doubles. Five doubles in the last 50 years, 53 years. That means you double every five years, every 10 years rather. So that means that's when we're around yep. seven, right? So basically, the way I think about it is that inflation, whenever you have a war, you have a pandemic, uh, you have to have inflation, you have to have, government has to pay for it. And when the government pays for it, then when you come out of it, they have to pay it back. The way they pay it back is not by paying down any debt. They pay it back by making your money worth less. So there's inflation. So the way we think about things is that inflation is going to reduce the value of your money in half about every 14 or 15 years. About 4 or 5% a year is inflation. That's my whole lifetime. 4 or 5%. Sometimes it's 2, sometimes it's 7, but 4 or 5% is the number. So you would never buy a 2-year bond or a 5-year bond or Ever. a 10-year bond? I, I've never owned a bond. Ever? Ever. Not one. So I, um, I'm invested in, and I don't have a lot, of, a lot of cash either. I'm always invested. And whenever I have a chance to buy more, I buy more. Good stuff. So he called out how there are always crazy things going on in the world and how he doesn't sit on cash. He also said that historically the market has about doubled your money every 10 years and inflation eats about a third of your buying power or something like that. I personally also stay invested in equities in all market conditions, even though I think 2024 will lead to a pullback. Okay, now onto the 25 single stock tickers I'm long in, which I'll go through alphabetically. My estimates are based on how I think earnings will improve in 2024 based on company performance along with evolving market conditions, including trying to factor in actions management might take like buybacks, coupled with incorporating what some professionals estimate, and through all that I came up with growth estimates ranging from 3% to 15% per ticker. First up is Apple, which is 2.8% of my dividend portfolio, and which I estimate will have 8.5% annualized earnings growth in 2024. You'll notice I included a few other useful metrics here, like its price when I did this video, its current dividend yield, its payout ratio, what Seeking Alpha has for its 5-year dividend gagger, and how many consecutive years of dividend increases it has. Some stocks are harder than others to estimate because they can vary materially based on unexpected product launches or performance. Like if Apple came out with a car that was a hit, then my estimates for growth would probably be low. Or if a company does a big acquisition, then that could also materially affect its earnings. Okay, next up is AbbVie, which is 5.1% of my portfolio, and which I estimate will have 4% annualized earnings growth. Now, that relatively low growth estimate might be surprising given that AbbVie has been growing at what, a bit over 10% a year? But I'm concerned about their go-forward pipeline, combined with increased regulatory hurdles I see them facing. Like last year, the CEO of AbbVie called out some legislation that would force drug manufacturers to accept the government's pharma prices or face a harsh tax on the revenues of specific products. AbbVie's CEO felt that this wasn't about the government negotiating prices with pharma companies, but instead was about price controls. And if things like that happen, then it can dampen AbbVie's future earnings growth. And another company that can get negatively impacted by new regulations is BTI, which is 2.9% of my portfolio, in which I estimate will have 4% earnings growth. Next up is the dividend aristocrat I own in Caterpillar at 2.1% of my portfolio, in which I estimate has a 4% annualized earnings growth in 2024. CAD is a tough one to estimate as I think their performance will be impacted by whether we go into a formal recession or not in 2024. But even with the potential recession at hand, I think CAT will still do fine with their various tailwinds, such as the uptick in needs for heavy machinery in areas like mining. Caterpillar has been a great stock of mine over the years, and I'm excited to see where they'll go in the upcoming decades. 
Next up is Colgate Palmolive at 1.8% of my portfolio, which I estimate has 5% earnings growth potential for 2024. Companies like CL can use pricing to push earnings up, but if they do it too much, then consumers toss aside their brand loyalty and instead seek out similar products that are cheaper. Like we often use Colgate toothpaste, but if the prices got too hairy, then we'd look elsewhere. And since we do so much shopping on Amazon, then that's the first place I'd look to buy competitive products to brands I like. Which is part of the reason why I'm bullish on Amazon and why my kids' brokerage accounts have a large percentage of their portfolios in it. Next up I have Chevron at 2.7% of my portfolio, and I estimate 4% earnings growth for them. Oil is another notoriously hard one to accurately estimate because the macroeconomic climate can impact them a ton. Like I saw this article talking about how Canada plans to phase out sales of gas-powered cars and trucks by 2035. But Chevron is one of the stronger oil stocks out there, which is why they're able to weather bad years without cutting their dividend, like some other oil companies had to do. Of course, sometimes it can make sense for a company to cut their dividend to shore up their financial health, but that can also mean that their management teams didn't allocate capital appropriately enough in good times so that they could still pay out in bad times. And big black swan events can happen that no amount of prep can realistically plan for. Okay, next up is Duke Energy at 3.7% of my portfolio, in which I estimate will grow at 5% in 2024. Following Duke, I have an MLP and Enterprise Products Partners, and for them I'll talk about an estimated increase in distributable cash flow, as they don't actually pay dividends and using normal metrics like EPS doesn't make sense for them. 4.4% of my portfolio is in EPD, and I estimate they'll grow by 5% in 2024. Next up alphabetically at 2.4% of my portfolio is Goldman Sachs, which I've given them a large 15% growth target in 2024. That might be too lofty, and Goldman has had some failures recently with the Marcus Consumer Banking Division and their partnership with the Apple Card, but they're going down an aggressive cost-cutting program, and their wealth management business, trading business, and lending business are all strong. Quick note, a couple months ago it came out that Goldman's CEO announced that he was stepping back from his side DJ gig so he could put 100% of his focus on growing the company. Okay, next up is Home Depot, which is 1.2% of my portfolio, and which I estimate will have 5% earnings growth in 2024. Home Depot is the type of company that can be materially affected by the economy and interest rates and home improvement demand and such over the short term. Like when rates are high, then many folks will defer taking out home equity loans to do home improvements. And even though inflation has been trending down nicely, I think most people feel that things are tough right now. I also felt their go-forward guidance was weak, though they could always perform better than I anticipated. I wouldn't be surprised if they went sideways or even slightly down for a while. Okay, 15 tickers to go, so let me speed up a bit. Next up is a classic dividend investor stock in J&J, which is 5.3% of my portfolio, and which I estimate will have 5.5% annualized earnings growth in 2024. Next is Kimberly Clark, which is 2.4% of my portfolio, and I estimate it will have 5% earnings growth. After KMB is Coca-Cola at 3.5% of my portfolio, and which I estimate will grow by 5% in 2024. Following KO is one of my favorites in McDonald's, which is 4.2% of my portfolio, and which I estimate will grow 7.5% next year. After them is Altria, ticker MO, at 5.6% of my portfolio, and which I estimate will grow its earnings by only 3% in 2024. Since stocks like Altria face a lot of headwinds, so definitely something to be wary of. Next is a heavy hitter in Microsoft, which is 4.9% of my portfolio, and one that I'm estimating will grow a massive 15% in 2024. I think Microsoft is expensive right now, but if its AI and cloud divisions can't perform nicely, then the future should be quite bright for them. After Microsoft is my favorite REIT and realty income at 7.2% of my portfolio, in which I estimate will grow 4% in 2024. O has gotten large enough that continuing to grow its FFO can get more challenging, but so far I'm liking the moves their management is doing. Okay, 8 more tickers to go, and next up is another favorite of mine in Pepsi at 4.6% of my portfolio, in which I estimate will grow 7% in 2024. After Pepsi is another I love in Procter & Gamble at 4% of my portfolio, in which I estimate will grow 7% in 2024. After PG is PM, another SIN stock I own at 2.2% of my portfolio, one which I think actually has some of the best growth potential of all my SIN stocks at 5% earnings accretion next year. Then is my favorite coffee company, aka Starbucks, at 1.1% of my portfolio, which I estimate will grow 10% in 2024. That's a pretty high earnings growth estimate, and of course a recession or big issues in China could pull things back for them. Then I have Southern Company, the other utility I own at 2.8% of my portfolio, and which I estimate will grow a great 8% in 2024. That's also a high earnings estimate, and I calculate that Southern is overpriced right now, so they'll need good earnings to keep justifying their price. I'm hoping their nuclear plant expansion goes smoothly next year, which could also help gas their earnings. My third to last single stock ticker is Toronto Dominion Bank at 1.8% of my portfolio, and which I estimate will have 4% growth in 2024. The world economy looks shaky next year, and I don't think Canada or the US will escape intact, especially not with the housing markets being overpriced and mortgages themselves looking suspect. But Canadian banks have done quite well navigating tough times in the past, so let's see if they can continue doing that next year. I wouldn't be surprised to see TD outperform my estimates, but I also wouldn't be surprised to see macroeconomic pressures negatively impact them more than I anticipate. Either way, I'm staying long, and I feel their shares are inexpensive right now. 
After TD is Traveler's Insurance at 1% of my portfolio, in which I estimate could grow a strong 10% earnings growth next year. I think TRV is reasonably priced right now, but 2023 was tough for them due to inflation, due to having more catastrophic losses than I'd have guessed. It's pretty amazing to think that Travelers was founded in 1864, and I actually own multiple companies that have been around since the 1800s, including Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, Colgate Palmolive, Chevron, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Goldman Sachs, Philip Morris, and ExxonMobil. I guess I like to own companies that have amazing durability to survive over 100 years. And speaking of ExxonMobil, which is my last ticker I'll be calling out, as I didn't mention my ETFs in SCHD, Devo, or JEPQ, well, XOM is 4.4% of my portfolio, and I estimate it will have 3% earnings growth in 2024. And with that, I hope you all have a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays. I'm not sure what my video output will be like over the next couple weeks as I'm heading to Disneyland for New Year's, but I'll see what I can do. And if you appreciated this video, then please show me your support by hitting that thumbs up button, subscribing if you haven't yet, and clicking that bell notification. Now, I'd normally shout out my newest Patreon or Scranton King signups, but I'm still all sold out. So instead, I'll thank Seeking Alpha who sponsors me. Consider getting yourself a valuable Christmas present and use my affiliate link in the description of this video to become a Seeking Alpha Premier user, as affiliate links often have bonuses for new users. And as always, I highly recommend that you join my free dividend Discord chat server, which has over 11,000 dividend investors on it from 76 countries around the world. Thanks for watching, Merry Christmas, and I'll talk to you again real soon. Remember, I'm not a financial advisor and my videos are for entertainment and inspirational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I'm only sharing my opinions with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.